This is document number one, exhibit number one, as if we were in court. My undergraduate degree, a BSc. Exhibit number two is the Master of Laws. Then exhibit number three was my Doctor of Philosophy. I was awarded that in August 1980. And in 1981, I was called to the bar in 1998. Those are the letters patent. That's the full bottom wig and the, the rough and the silk gown. I, did, I looked young and eager then, I think. This is the document appointing me as a High Court judge. And this one here is the conferment of the Order of Dane Commander of the British Empire, a knighthood that comes on appointment to the High Court bench. When I came to the UK, that was when I was seven. I was usually the only um, person of colour in the area. I would have names, um, you know, thrown out at me by the kids, or they would do things. And I remember a great sense of injustice about that. I've always been somebody who's been slightly angry, and I do get angry at injustices. My father was a, a lawyer, and then he went on to the High Court bench, so the law was in my family. He died when I was 17. All my family were saying, well, you must follow your father's footsteps, go into the law. And I was not going to do what I was told. I was going to do what I wanted to do. So initially, um, I did music. And I realised once I got there, because mu even my music teacher was saying, yes, yes, you're good, dear, but keep it as a hobby. All my peers, or most of them, every spare moment they were down in the basement, you know, in their, their practice rooms doing their scales and everything. And I realised then, what, looking at um, my contemporaries, that I didn't have the necessary dedication to get anywhere in music. So my family was right, I hated to admit it. So it, it wasn't in a way my decision to do law, I sort of fell into it. I was lucky to get the pupillage that I did, which was in these chambers, and at the time the Attorney General was the head of chambers, Sir Michael Havers. I'd left it very late. It, this was August, when nobody's around in the temple, um, but the secretary of the committee was around, and he said, well, we're actually full up, but if um, a certain member of chambers I have in mind, if he's prepared to have two pupils, then we'll offer you a pupillage. So I met my pupil master to be, we got on very well. He said, yes, I'll take two pupils, and the rest is history. There were always female pupils, but getting the tenancy was um, not so easy. And it, it wasn't really so much the members of chambers, although the older ones still favoured the chaps. Um, it was the clerks in those days, I mean, not our clerks now. And actually some of the instructing solicitors, who didn't want a woman, most likely because their clients wouldn't want a woman. One chap I remember who was up for drink driving, I turned up, called the chap's name out, and he took one look at me and he said, I told the solicitor I didn't want a woman. We walk out an hour or so later from the court. He's acquitted, unjustifiably, but he's, 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 he's acquitted. And instead of saying thank you very much, he storms off saying, I'm going to ring that solicitor. How dare they ignore my instructions? I found out subsequently from one solicitor who used to send me work, the clerk keeps on saying, you're not available, and I'm saying, well, I was available. And what the clerk had been doing was tipexing my name out and giving it to the male pupil that they wanted to be taken on as a member of chambers. It was difficult to complain about things in those days. There were no procedures. None of that was recorded, so to try and prove that, you know, you were being discriminated against was very difficult indeed. What bothered me sometimes was, I think it was a test where I opened the brief and it was to re represent a couple of national front youngsters who had thrown a brick through an Asian shopkeeper's um, window. So I went to see the clerk because my clerk was on holiday and I said, do you think this is a very good idea? You know, they're clearly national front boys. And so he said to me, he said, oh, don't worry, Miss Dobbs. He said, um, 
he said, just do Al Jolson in reverse. He was a singer who used to um, black himself up and have white lips. And, um, and so he was saying, you know, get a bit of tennis white and, you know, sort of um, do that to your face. They won't know the difference. I remember, um, I think it was Rudy Narayan when I was taken on, um, he made some comment about the Attorney General taking on a token black and that I was just a coconut. Um, I, I didn't know what that <laughs> I meant in those days. Well, I do, I do now. You know, I was brown on the outside, white on the inside. It wasn't pleasant, but you had to, if you got too upset about it, then you weren't able to do your job properly. I would sort of avoid things till people started, you know, just literally saying, right, we want you to be this, we want you to be chair of that and chair of this and chair of that. And I'd be saying, no, I don't think I ought to do that. And they'd say, yes, you are, we want you to do it. And then that's how, you know, I, I did an, a lot of things on the Bar Council, a lot of committees, and also eventually took silk. I, I shouldn't say I was reluctant, but um, it was at a time when there was a hybrid system, the Lord Chancellor still had a residual power to tap on the shoulder. I received a phone call from the Lord Chancellor. And the trouble is with these things, the Lord Chancellor's office phoned my clerks and everybody knows when the Lord Chancellor wants to have a word with you, they usually know what that means. So of course it was all around my chambers before I'd even put the phone down. It felt rather hypocritical being offered the opportunity and to be the first um, to say no. I had had the common sense to go into the courtroom beforehand and sit in the seat, so I felt, I knew what it felt like. I'd got in early and I said to my clerk, I said, show me where the court is. We got into court and the court was jam-packed full. And my clerk says to me, <laughs> rather tactlessly, he says, oh my goodness, he says it's full. He says, it's never usually this full. He said, oh, they've probably all come to see what you like. Well, that was all the <laughs> confidence boosting I needed because I was absolutely terrified. I was in the Queen's Bench Division to begin with, and I'd never done any civil work in my life before, so that was going to be testing enough. The listing officer thought they'd been kind to me by giving me lots of applications because they thought they'd you know, gently ease me in. But it was lots of applications in different areas of law that I'd never done in my life before. So when um, counsel would stand up and say, well, your ladyship will be very familiar with the case of X, and of course, I'd never heard of it before, so I would be saying, well, Mr. So-and-so, remind me of the main points of it. You know, you'd be developing these techniques to carry yourself through, so I, it was absolutely terrifying. Somebody's got to start the ball rolling, and perhaps if, you know, the ball starts rolling, you know, there'll be change. I was a little optimistic because it took seven years before the next person was appointed to the High Court bench from a minority ethnic background, which is rather disappointing. People don't realise that it can be lonely. I don't think people quite understand um, what it's like to sort of feel that perhaps you're, you're not one of the chaps. You don't quite fit in. There's a big challenge in people saying, look, we've done diversity, we've done enough, we don't need to do it anymore. Well, and actually, we do need to do it because we're not um, yet in the mainstream uh, uh, at all, especially in the senior judiciary. We, we know that at present rate, it'll take 50 years for there to be parity. It's always said that we're a highly respected judiciary in the UK. This is what we always say. But then we look at the figures of women in the judiciary and in the senior judiciary, for instance, um, let alone minority ethnic um, members. And, and we're, we're pretty well at the bottom. You look at the background of the majority of the bar and um, the senior judiciary in particular, where do they come from? They came from the traditions of Oxford, Oxford and Cambridge, most of them. If it's all, all, all men of the same background, they will have had similar experiences. If you get some people from different backgrounds, even if we, you're talking about class, you're getting those that have, have fought their way up working class um, youngsters who fought their way up and uh, are now there. That's all part of the diversity and, and they bring a different perspective and experience. It, it is very important for people to see role models. What I'm proud of is not, not so much the appointments, but for me, um, I, I do feel 
that I have made a difference to a lot of young people because I, I, I've always had an open door policy um, for youngsters, young aspiring lawyers, law students, young lawyers. I mentor a lot of people still. Um, and for me, it's all about unlocking potential.